In today's video, we're going to go over some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. The following video is from a livestock inspector who lives in Mariana, Arizona, which is near Tucson. He has been documenting quite a bit of weird experiences and what he thinks may be skinwalker activity near his ranch. This video, he comes, he notices actually something run across in front of him, what he initially thought was a coyote. As he goes outside to record and maybe capture a glimpse of it, something weird happens. What sounds like a child or a goat starts screaming. He's a livestock inspector, so he would know what a goat looks like if it ran out in front of his truck. It's not what he saw. So if it's not a goat, what's out there? Take a look at this footage and you tell me. Just saw looked almost like a coyote run right across here. That sounded like a kid or a goat. Yeah, pretty much like he said, that pretty much sounded like a little baby goat to me. I wish I could have seen whatever he's seen run across the road. That would have been a really nice help to identify what it could have potentially been. It could have been a coyote chasing a baby goat. If there's even baby goats out there in this field, that could be the creepy part of it. He didn't sound like he was scared that there was creatures out there that he was not aware of. He sounded like he was afraid that there might have been a predator out there that was attacking the livestock. This man was in the office late one evening by himself when weird things started happening. At first it was noises, sounds, and then lights flickering. And eventually it scares him to death and he runs out of the office. But the security cam still keeps rolling. And it's at the end that it captures what exactly what was in that office with him. And it's terrifying. Take a look at this footage. I guarantee you can bet he's never going to be in that building doing his job alone ever again. If that happened to me, I'd probably be out just as fast. 
I cannot tell if this is a real or fake video. It looks pretty genuine. It really looks like a business that's recording the office and everything. It's just super blurry and that's kind of weird to me as to why does this business have this blurry camera system. But other than that, it looks pretty genuine. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. Do you think it was hoaxed or do you think this is a real paranormal event? Why is everything closing for good? Dollar Tree closing 600 stores this year. CVS closing 900 stores. Through the end of this year, Walgreens closing 150 stores. Outback Steakhouse has already closed 40 of its restaurants. UPS is cutting 12,000 jobs in 2024. Citigroup cutting 20,000 positions as well. eBay, why not? 1,000 jobs lost there. Microsoft cutting 1,900 positions. Expedia, cutting 1,500. Cisco, cutting 4,000. Apple, cutting 600. It's entertainment, too. Regal Cinemas, closing 429 locations. Kroger's grocery store chain, shutting down 413 stores. It's not affordable to be in retail anymore. Foot Locker closing 400 stores by 2026. Macy's will close 150 locations by 2026. Walmart, already this year, has closed six of its super centers. While the U.S. Senate has passed nearly $100 billion to send to other countries that Joe Biden just signed yesterday, most can't even find Ukraine or Israel on a freaking map, let alone Taiwan. We're paying money that we don't have as our economy goes down the toilet and American jobs die. Of course, we know we're going to ban TikTok so nobody can talk about it freely. I'm really sorry for anyone out there that loses their job because of these shutdowns. I know that's got to be horrible. And I hope the best for everyone that goes through such a hard time. The light was reflecting off of this thing like nothing I'd ever seen before. And at that point, my heart goes up. Okay, this can go bad real fast. So I, I, I realize that as I am settling down to take another look and reevaluate what this thing is, now I can see a corner and a flat face. I'm like, this is, uh, at the time I was thinking man-made and probably bad. Um, and then I kind of, I stop and my thin tips are on the seafloor. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm lowering my camera down just a little bit, trying to look over my lights. And that's when I see that this thing is a cube. I can see the top of this. It's, it's about three feet across and three feet deep. And it's a gold, shiny, back illuminated cube. And my heart just went right up on my throat. And I, I did not like this feeling at all. It, I felt totally toyed with by whatever this was. I started to uh, swim towards this thing. And it would maintain its distance away from me absolutely perfectly. And I'm descending along the the seamount as fast as I can swim and gallop off the bottom, holding my camera up. This thing is able to keep that exact distance. So, And as I rest on the bottom, I'm putting my camera face down. And that's when the first time when I really saw the whole thing, when I took my lights completely off of it. Now I can actually see that this thing was a cube suspended off the bottom. And it was just perfect. It was beautiful and terrifying. This bothered me for years when I saw this. And it was in Sea Cortez. I never told anybody what I saw until just this year. I would love to see the footage of this because that sounds way too good to be true. And man, let me tell you, I guarantee you that's got to be an experience, a terrifying one at that. Imagine you think you see a UFO in the water. That alone is terrifying because what if it draws you into the water and you can't escape? Like, what if you're just forever stuck in the water until you drown? That's what would go through my head. I'm fine with seeing UFOs in the sky and everything, but once it becomes a USO, I'm kind of scared, especially if I'm in the water with it. Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And to everyone that's subscribed, thank you so much for being subscribed to the channel. And to everyone that's not subscribed, I still appreciate you nonetheless. Thank you for watching. And don't forget, if you want to be a part of Questions for DK where I answer personal questions, questions about conspiracy theories or theories in general, leave a comment starting with Question for DK 
so that I can find it in YouTube search results and answer those questions in a future video. This is really just a guideline for you to know basic hand placements for you guys to get a better understanding of mudras. Your hands are meridians. This is where energy flows to. This is your electrical circuit board. Your fingertips are the circuits for the brain. I'm just going to start off by saying the exact way that these all go does not matter. What matters is you can have the idea so you can go through them, feel the ones that you like, feel the ones that feel right, that you think your body needs. <clears throat> I'm just giving you the layout of different ways that you can do it. Power, energy, harmony, healing, intuition, and awareness is all basically the same thing. As long as you're touching these circuits together, you're going to fire off the electrical charge to your brain because your fingertips are all circuits to your brain. You're trying to get your brain to function properly. The power mudra, you've also seen Andrew Tate do something similar for knowledge. You could have the <clears throat> bottom fingers on the outside, or you could do as they show here, pass them to the inside, have it pointed. Just like that. The energy mudra, it looks intimidating, but it's really not. Just like, ah, I have my fingers crossed. I'm going to cross both of them like that. Just have the tips touching. Remember, it's the tips that are the circuit board. So you want all the tips to touch. So it looks like that. Energy mudra. The harmony mudra, it's a little different. It's a little harder. But if you see the tops, these three are out and touching. So these ones just cross under, and then these ones close. So you get a little crisscross action. These are not tucked. It's just the two in the middle that are tucked. So it looks like that. Sounds a little difficult. It's going to take a little practice moving your fingers into place. Harmony Mudra. For the Healing Mudra, these two are out and the pinky. Then you're going to cross these guys and tuck the other two behind it. So you get a little crisscross action. It looks like that. Healing Mudra. Intuition Mudra, all clasped, all crossed. You can have your thumbs crossed, have them forward. It doesn't matter. Like I said, this is just to give you guys a basic knowledge and an outline of ways to put your hand positionings so that you can practice it during your meditation. And whatever feels right in your meditation, go with it. Things change. You find a different one that you feel goes with the flow of your meditation. That's all that I'm here to do. Awareness mudra intertwined in. You have them to the top like that or tucked. Like I said, it really doesn't matter. I'm just giving you guys the building blocks of the hand positions for the mudras so that you can figure it out on your own. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. Just as long as you could flip through these and figure out what feels right during your meditation, then you're on the right path. Where I'm from, you have to be careful where you're throwing up hand signs like that because that can really get you hurt. I've heard of these hand mudras. It really looks like something off of Naruto. It's really cool looking. It's a cool act. I guess I've never really practiced it. I've never really studied it that much. I do notice that I, 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 I do this a lot just naturally. These patterns and connections that you can do with your hands can signal to your brain and cause these different effects. I don't know if I necessarily believe it, but it is a really interesting thing. Some people would probably consider this to be demonic in a way. I'm pretty certain back in the day my grandma would have not been a fan of me doing things like this. She would have considered that to be some form of Satanism. But uh, overall, I do think it's really cool, and I really do not know if it's helpful or not. Have any of you guys practiced this style of mudra? Are you aware if it works or not? Let me know in the comments because I'm interested in that. If it if it doesn't hurt you to do a couple of hand gestures here and there and it, it can support you and make you a better person or bring some kind of positivity into your life, hey, I'm here for it. So I really don't know why we're not talking about this more, but there is a scientist who just discovered um, the planet's been known for a while, but they just found a lot of evidence that there actually might be life, like for real, for real this time. Like, this scientist who discovered it said there's a 50% chance there might be, like, 
life, but like not only just life, not like earth, but like a lot more evidence that there's a lot more life on this planet, K215, K218B, K215B, um, that there's like a shit ton of life on this planet because it's got the same chemical makeup as us, as earth. But then, um, I'm really bad at remembering things, um, specific, but like, that's fucking real. University of Toronto. Look it up. I have nothing against other planets containing life. If other planets exist, that's my biggest quarrel. Is I'm still figuring out if space and the stars are real or if there really is a firmament above us and space is just particles in the firmament and there's no outer space. I do not necessarily believe that. I do believe that there is outer space. It starts to get a little sketch to me when scientists claim that there is life on other planets and that they know the chemical makeup that each planet has, how fast it spins, things like that. That's when it starts to be a little hard to believe for me personally because I just don't understand, I guess, because of the science behind it, how someone can prove or theorize that there is life on those distant stars when we can't even see it but just the light pattern that it produces, you know? I'm not saying that they're liars or anything like that. I'm just saying I'm not smart enough to comprehend that because it just seems so unrealistic to me. But nonetheless, really cool if it's real because I would love for there to be other planets out there that are containing life. And I'm not talking about life that's necessarily as sophisticated as our own life, but just imagine a planet out there that's a complete water planet and it's full of aquatic life, like whales, different forms of crabs, things like that that all look different because of the area that they're in. That sounds really fascinating to me. Dude, y'all seen these 600 million year old fossils of tiny humanoids in Antarctica? Allegedly. Divide would be the location, I would assume. The Whitmore Mountain Range is where they were found. Interestingly enough, this discovery was made while yours truly was in Antarctica on assignment for the National Reporter. To debunk a ridiculous story about a UFO base in the area, pfft, who would think that? What they found astonished them. We tested the fossils and had determined without a shadow of a doubt they are at least 600 million years old. I mean, they do look pretty cool though, seriously, look at that. If that's actually real. When we split the rock apart, we were completely confused. Here was this fossil from an age when the appearance of the first vertebrates was still millions of years off and it was a completely skeleton. Complete skeleton, my bad. Now the second skeleton is a very good specimen, unlike the first one. If you have to ask yourself, am I being serious in this video, guess we'll never know. You cannot deny that those are little people if those are real because those look exactly like little humanoid skeletons. So maybe in Antarctica there's not full sized people, but little people could possibly be fairy type. Again though, if this is real. It's a really cool discovery and it just makes me wonder what really is that? Is that really a humanoid figure or could it be a bird of some sort and it just looks human like? And 600 million years old? That's really old. Let me know what you guys think of these tiny humanoid looking skeletons. Do you think they're real or has there been a follow up update on this and I'm not aware of it? Let me know in the comments if you know anything about this. Did you have an interest in flying saucers or science fiction in general as a child? I was never interested in flying saucers as a child. Science fiction, you know, I watched Star Trek, I guess, with everyone else back then. But uh, for the most part, you know, I didn't even believe in flying saucers up until I was employed at S4. As we enter the 21st century, how has your experience changed your beliefs? Well, if you want to word the question, how are my opinions changed, uh, I would say considerably. Before I was at S4... I was more or less one of the uh, one of the guys that thought, you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. I even remember before I was involved there, a friend showed me a little newspaper clipping and said John Lear was giving a lecture who was uh, touting that aliens from another world came to Earth and there's 70 different species. And I remember laughing on the phone that this guy had lost his mind. I was also under the impression that, you know, well, the government's all for the people and they, you know, you know, they're out here to protect us and all that. And, you know, after the experiences I had there, uh, everything is completely turned around. You know, the, the government is doing everything 
but uh, looking out for us. I mean, the only thing they're looking out is for themselves. Obviously, the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are, and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if, in fact, that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others, actual crafts and technology from another world. And uh, that's probably the most important event in history. It kind of moved from science fiction into reality, in my mind. And uh, it really just, I guess, opened my eyes. We can duplicate it. I don't know if we can understand what a device is or how something operates or what its physical makeup is, that's great. But if we can't duplicate it, it's useless to us. So there's really two phases to the project going on there. It's understanding what we're looking at. And then once we understand it, is can we duplicate it with earthly materials and earthly technology? And, you know, unless we've got a handle on both of them, all that technology is useless to us. And if it turns out we can't do that, all we have is one single prized possession that we have to take care of, and that's it. After all that's been said and done, would you do this over again? What would you do differently? I would probably have played along for a longer time. Um, I would like to have known a little bit more about the technology and uh, probably kept quiet if I could have. Um, and possibly never have said anything. Uh, I almost wish I had done that. You know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really only caused headaches and problems. But um, I believe if I was given the opportunity again to go back in time and redo it, I think I pretty much would have just shut up and gone along with the program. I would have much preferred that instead of the Navy or whoever it was, uh, that hand-picked a few renegade scientists here and there, that they turn it over to some more qualified people. Obviously, I was not the most qualified person on propulsion or field propulsion or anything of that sort. I was just some guy. I mean, they could have picked, I could have named 10 or 12 other guys that were more qualified than me. But they turned it over to the scientific community and not just a couple of guys here in the United States. I mean, you need a large group of people in a large lab to research what's going on there. Uh, not a little quiet installation. It's the, it's the security itself that prevents them from getting anywhere. I mean, it, it, they never do work hand in hand. You can't have a, a military mind. Science itself must communicate. You have to have a free exchange of ideas. That's how things progress. And when you clamp down on a security system like that, where you work in isolated groups, and ideas cannot be exchanged, you don't get anywhere, and that's that's the problem they have. Man, I really enjoy Bob Lazar clips, and you can definitely tell when he says that if he could do it all over again, he would just do it and stay quiet. You can tell he means that. Yeah, he would stick with it a little bit longer and not be so open about it, because he needs to dive in deeper to explore more of this. I can't say I would do the same if I was in his position, because I would also really want to talk about it. I like talking, and talking about this kind of stuff, I don't know if I would be able to be quiet about it. Out of all whistleblowers, he's probably my most favorite whistleblower out of all of them. Let me know in the comments if you guys are a big fan of Bob Lazar. I know a few of you are, and rightfully so, because the topics that he's talking about are just phenomenal. What if I can take over the world? Are there other people like me that are driven by wanting to take over the world? What if we could make the world one place and we make all the decisions for everybody because I'm probably one of the smartest people in the world. I'm probably, and you know, that conversation is taking place. Again, you really start having that godlike figure. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with George Soros. You know, in one of the interviews he gave to LA Times, he says, I always fancied myself with being a god. Fancied myself with being a god. This is an LA Times interview 20 plus years ago. If you type in George Soros, LA Times God, it's the most disturbing interview to read about this guy. A lot of people are very skeptical about him, right? He's well, like the boogeyman of a, a number of conspiracies. How many, how many people have you heard say, I always fancied myself with being a god? He says, but what's great about where I'm at right now is it's no longer a 
dreamed. It became a reality. That's the scariest part about someone being so wealthy. Are they mentally stable enough to be a genuinely good person or are they going to let that much power corrupt their mind? Because when you are a billionaire, even millionaires, you basically are untouchable in a lot of situations depending on who you are as a person. You can pay off companies, you can pay off whole groups of communities. There is so many things that you can get away with just because you have money that it's scary and I think a lot of people with money think that and they know that and then it gives them this sense of godlike ego because they feel so powerful it's really scary that we have that much money out there in the world to make someone feel almost as if they are a god and don't get me wrong would I enjoy millions of dollars Heck yeah, I would definitely enjoy millions of dollars, but it would not make me think that I'm godly. It would not make me think any different of who I am and what I am now. But then again, I've never had that much money, so I really don't know. Maybe when you have that much money, it corrupts you. And that's an interesting theory to take into consideration. Money actually might make you a bad person once you reach a certain limit of financial status. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how big your army is, you ain't getting into this place. This is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, one of the most secure places on Earth. Inside, there's more than 1.2 million seed samples from all over the world. It was built to protect the future of the world's food supply in case a nuclear war destroys the ecosystem. This vault was built literally inside a mountain to ensure maximum security. But let's say you really wanted to go to this place, what do you gotta do? First thing is, you gotta get permission from two separate governments. And you know how much governments love giving permission and how easy they are to work with. Then you gotta fly to the island of Svalbard, which is next to the North Pole. After that, you gotta hike in the frozen tundra and make your way up to the vaults. Then you gotta get past the first steel door on the outside, followed by four more steel doors on the inside. And if you can do all that, you'll see the boxes full of seats, neatly organized and separated by the country they came from. Or you can do a virtual tour online. It's free and you won't freeze your balls off. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I kind of want to do the virtual tour just to see the inside of it. I guarantee you they're probably holding a lot more than just seeds in that vault, though. There's probably human DNA being harvested, all kinds of stuff. And what if something happens to the Earth, like a doomsday event? Now they have to travel all the way to the North Pole, survive all of those extremely harsh conditions to just get seeds. That's a little bit of a far stretch, if you ask me. It's good that we have such a system to support our world, but they could have probably picked a little bit easier to access place with still having the security that this place has, you know? Wait a minute, y'all. Were you guys aware that the White House has ordered NASA to give the moon its own time zone? They're calling it coordinated lunar time and they have till 2026 to get this complete. What is this about? What like what is this about? What time is it on the moon? Well, soon we might actually be able to answer that because the U.S. has asked NASA to establish a unified standard of time for the moon. The White House said it was vital to set international norms as nations and private companies race to establish a more permanent lunar presence. And NASA has until 2026 to figure it out. The time zone will be called Coordinated Lunar Time. Let's speak to Professor Catherine Heymans, astronomer for uh, Scotland. R very good to see you. What a challenge. How hard is it going to be to work out what the time is on the moon? Um, well, people might be wondering, why is the time on the moon not just the same as the time on Earth? You know, in, in our own everyday life, you know, time you know, ticks by. Um, but Einstein's law of general relativity tells us that time isn't absolute. It changes depending on where you are in the universe. The rate that clocks tick depends on the gravity where you are. Um, now, the way we define time here on Earth is using atomic clocks. Um, there is the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in France. Uh, they monitor these atomic clocks and that sets the universal coordinated time that we use um, every day here on Earth. Now, if you took those atomic clocks up to the moon, they would run slightly faster because the gravity on the moon is less. Uh, you might remember the picture of the astronauts when they uh, landed at the Apollo missions, they bounce up and down. That's because the gravity is less on the moon. And the consequence of that, the, the sort of the fundamental nature of gravity is that the clocks run faster. Now, it's not too much faster. Um, if you took an atomic clock up there, 50 years later, it would only be running one second faster. So it's only a very small time difference. 
but it's enough to cause real problems when you are looking at space travel and humans uh, inhabiting the moon, which is NASA's long-term plan. Catherine, you mentioned the Apollo mission. There have been others as well. So what's happened up until now? Do different countries use their own time zones when they go up there? Exactly, yeah. So there are different ways that you can define it. You might want to uh, define the time based on Earth, based on your own country, based on wherever your um, Houston centre is or equivalent. Um, so there's there's not been a sort of a coordinated um, time. And you, you could imagine this would be okay if it was, if it was just different nation space agencies but now we have private companies as well also racing to the moon there was the recent uh the, the first u.s company to land on the moon recently with intuitive machines so the moon is becoming a really busy place and if we want to keep it safe uh then we need to define a standard uh, time that everyone can stick to and agree to um now this was actually called for more than a year ago by the european space agency so the white house are just catching up here um but it's important because because the White House has the most ambitious um, time to get humans back on the moon. The plan is for humans to be landing on the moon again at the end of 2026. And China is planning uh, astronauts to land there in 2030. So it's uh, exciting times ahead for human exploration on the moon. Catherine, you mentioned how busy it's going to be, but it also reflects too, doesn't it, the just ongoing fascination that everyone has for the moon. Absolutely. I think, you know, we, we all love the moon. It's, it's a constant in our life, but it's also changing depending, you know, sometimes we see it as a crescent moon. Sometimes we see it as a full moon. It's always there. It's always beautiful to look at up. Um, people, if you have binoculars that are gathering. It's changing. She, she literally just said the moon is always changing, which I told y'all that that's not the moon. It's a different moon. That is the mothership. First thing I thought upon seeing this lady is a reptilian with a face mask. Because that right there, it looks like a skin mask on her. It literally looks like a skin mask on her. Second thought, bloodlust. You can literally see it all over her face. Like, she's literally, like, you get what I'm saying? Bloodlusting. Come on. You know these people work in these media. You know these people work. You know the reptilians work in that media. And why does this sound like the same thing that's going on with Antarctica, right? Coordinated lunar time where they're all going to come to an agreement about the time of the moon hmm? this is a lot deeper than we think you guys and she told y'all that the moon is always changing and now we're seeing two moons in the sky three moons in the sky sometimes four moons in the sky hmm? i told y'all that is not the moon the game is coming to an end and they know that but what do you guys make of the white house commissioning nasa to make a a universal time for the moon where everybody could be in alignment you know what is going on with the moon this just further validates my theory that there's already people on the moon that's working in warehouses or are at least constructing warehouses. And there's a conflict now between other countries that the time frame is different. So they need to have a unified measurement of time. I'm almost 100% certain if the moon is real, there's people out there on it that are working a factory job of some sort. And in the future, because this is just what humans do, they're probably gonna fight over territory eventually once it starts to get a little bit more commercialized to the public. I have a feeling that there's going to be space wars within the next 50 to 60 years. There's going to be people up there in space battling for land let me know what you guys think about this do you think that there's actually people up on the moon do you think that maybe they're planning on putting a lot of people on the moon and that's why they're doing this time system or do you think that it's just a whole bunch of news media to keep us distracted from something greater because none of that stuff even exists in the first place. Let me know in the comments. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here today. I really hope everyone had a good Mother's Day yesterday. And as always, if you found any of these clips interesting, links are in the description down below. And with that being said, have a good day.